When you talk about climate change anywhere, anytime, there's always someone will come up with, but what about surely it's not due to us or surely it was, and, and, and there's always an excuse um, for, uh, for not continuing this debate to try and adapt to climate change. So I have got six myths that I'm running through and the first one is that it was warmer in the time of Christ. Now that's the kind of thing Tony Abbott was saying a lot um, and obviously people had talked to him about it um, and it got around that somehow or other that was right. Um, but the data is unequivocal. This is now. That was then, and it's, it's been pretty steady right through that period. went down a bit here, you can see the little ice age. But now we've just taken off up here, way warmer than back in the time of Christ. So any use of data like that can just explode that myth. It's not as though that statement has any truth in it whatsoever. So the... And the the differences are very stark if you get a, a zero point here and just show the way in which the last century has essentially taken us into a whole new era. The second myth is it's been cooling lately while CO2 has been rising. Now there's a little bit of truth in this because if you see the graph, uh, you can see that <clears throat> there's, there's a little bit of drop here in the temperature um, with with uh, the global uh, thrust right through this period, if you take five-year averages, it's continuing to go up. But uh, uh, there was a, an independent senator who frequently used to hold this up in, in public meetings or in, in, even in Parliament, showing the last five years with temperatures going down and, and CO2 going up. So, um, but essentially it started back up again because uh, the statistics works out. There's a number of factors in any climate system that will affect the overall temperature and CO2 is a major one and is in fact driving a lot of the change now. So it's gone back up again and now we're in the hottest period ever again. Um, myth three is that most CO2 comes from volcanic sources, not human. That couldn't possibly be us. Ah, surely the world is, you know, and the planet has is, is got much bigger forces at work than anything we could do. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work done on that. Uh, the natural forces uh, from volcanoes, which does release things like methane, um, contributes about 20% to global warming. 80% is from humans. Myth four is that solar flares have a bigger impact on climate change. Um, the number of people who come up to me and say that. Now, you're one of these scientists who believes in climate change, but surely it's coming from the sun, and that's a far bigger factor. Solar flares happen and, and it changes the climate. Well, they do change the climate, but when you look at the overall effects, that's the solar flare effect there. These are all the other factors that are human-induced. Some of them, in fact, like aerosols and some um, surface changes, surface albedo changes, actually cool the earth. But most of them are providing greenhouse gases that are changing the atmosphere and warming. So the overall effect is this, and the vast majority of the changes are human-induced might be hard to accept, but it's true. Myth five, it doesn't matter if it gets warmer. I mean, especially in winter, couldn't we do with a little bit of warmth? And the Brits say this all the time. Um, well, it does matter because it's, it's not as though we just generally feel a bit warmer. The reality is that extra energy in the atmosphere changes climate in more dramatic ways, like the Gulf of Mexico heated up to levels that had never happened before and Katrina devastated New Orleans. These are the kind of impacts you get from global warming. 
they're very specific. And the flooding, the Pakistan floods, where about a third of the country went underwater. Now, they do get a lot of rain there in monsoon times, but there was nothing like this in their history. Melbourne had a week of 45 degrees. Uh, this is not normal, and it, the whole area around it um, caught on fire. These are from the Doncaster Hill looking out at the, at the hills around all on fire. In WA, there are lots of potential impacts. Um, probably the biggest one of all is, is to do with rainfall reductions. But uh, sea level change is likely to impact along our coast in various places. The city of Mandurah has looked at some of the impacts there. And uh, most coastal councils are now taking very seriously um, the possibilities of, of sea level change. Because sea level is rising. And this is a, um, a, a very clear sense that IPCC predictions, which are the, um, uh, the, the, the line there, the red line, that, um, no, that, that the IPCC predictions were essentially out this way. The actual tidal gauges and the satellite observations, which are more precise, are very clearly on a line that's going up. So we've, we've had um, uh, two to three centimetres of change, you know, this kind of much, but it's, uh, it's inexorably going up, and that does mean that when you have storm surges or low pressure systems going through, um, the effect is, is magnified. In WA, it's been very clear. This is uh, Fremantle, Geraldton, Bunbury, and uh, the line through is the line for Fremantle. And uh, it's, it's on its way. It's, it's going to uh, keep going at 1.5 millimetres a year. The number and cost of weather-related disasters is now, uh, data on that is, is kept. Uh, the World Watch Institute published this each year and, and you can see that there is a rise, an increase happening. Reduced rainfall has to be the impact that we in Western Australia have felt most. Now I say Western Australia because it's really just the southwest corner. The rest of the state has had an increase in rainfall, but uh, in this corner, where most of the people live, it's pretty serious. This is the reduction in groundwater levels, and it's in the Yarragadi Aquifer, but it's, it's used for water supply. But we're talking here of 15 to 20 metre declines. Um, that that is uh, not sustainable if that keeps going. Um, and so the aquifers are reflecting the fact that this area is drying. Of course it impacts on the native vegetation. Uh, you can't adapt that quickly. So there are tree deaths and they're happening right across this southwest corner. But also it does impact seriously on our water supply. Coral reefs, as the ocean warms and acidifies, you are, there are very serious predictions about the uh, impacts and we've already had a big impact on the Ningaloo Reef uh, when we had a, a sudden increase last year in the temperature of the water right down the coast. Biodiversity in general uh, is going to be impacted because it will move if it can um, to adapt to the changes. Uh, essentially the desert's moving further south, uh, the um, forests are, are changing. Um, if animals and plants and birds can shift, then they will, but many of them can't. So it's predicted that there will be a loss of biodiversity. The sixth myth is that there is no hope that we can make the changes necessary. Now, I think that it is the biggest and most dangerous myth of all. Uh, it undermines the whole of civilization. If you can't deal with this one, we're stuffed. We have no hope as a 
uh, a group of cities around the world, as economies, as regions, um, if we can't make the necessary adjustments, then we'll disappear. Uh, this did happen in, in um, Greenland. There was a, a climate change effect there. Uh, they didn't make the necessary adaptions and the entire society there disappeared, as told in the, in the book Collapse. So it is a, a big issue. But if we approach it with despair, that is beyond us, uh, that often leads to emergency style approaches which essentially mean you give power to people to do things quickly and you don't necessarily choose the right people to do that and uh, totalitarian responses aren't necessarily going to work. Uh, if you've got a good climate change oriented benevolent dictator it might. But what are the chances? Perhaps you'll just get a Pol Pot who killed a third of his population in the name of ecology to make a simpler, more Buddhist-oriented um, society. Anyone who lived in a city or could read and write, that was enough to have them killed. These things happen. Now, I know a particular group called the Climate Emergency Network that say we should now declare a state of emergency have a, uh, a government as in wartime and uh, essentially be run by experts who will be brought in to ration everything. Uh, who would that be? That would be them. Well, I'm not sure I would trust them. I think we have to believe in the system enough to bring about the changes. And these changes can be quite simple. For example, all of the suburbs in this area of Perth are low-lying and are likely to be inundated. And every now and then someone gets up and says, we're going to lose billions of dollars of real estate. And um, we will if we don't do anything about it because the sea levels are rising. But there's a little bridge here and we're about to replace these two road and rail bridges. Uh, when we do that, you put on a barrage a barrage that can enable you to keep the water out when you need to and let the water out this way when you need to. Uh, it's now on many rivers like the Thames. Uh, most cities are formed at the mouth of rivers. So this is a, a technique. It's an ocean engineering technique. Um, you can put up sea walls and so on here and you can do barrages. Um, it, it's not beyond us to, to do that kind of thing. Um, but globally, you have to believe that the global processes are going to be big enough to deal with this. The Copenhagen Roadmap uh, didn't come out with the specific legal system uh, that everybody was hoping for, but it did come up with this limit and say we must, get, must not get beyond the 450 parts per million. So everybody's now adjusting their futures around that figure. And it is leading to action plans that are now being delivered. Um, Europe is clearly a step ahead there. But what I'm finding around the world is that extraordinary commitments are being made. Um, and we are seeing that there are real efforts being taken. China uh, is putting in so much renewables now that, uh, that they are reducing their need for Australian coal. Um, significantly and they uh, have done the calculations which show that this year they will um, peak in their greenhouse gas emissions and start going down and will never go beyond that. This is a historic turning point for a, a major emerging country. Um, it is uh, has an economy that is much poorer than the developed world and yet they're making this commitment and are doing it. So we will see more and more countries going over that limit and that plateau coming down and reducing their greenhouse. Australia is committed to that too. We've got substantial goals set um, and the treaties are continuing to be worked on. Uh, eventually there will be a global treaty to phase out fossil fuels.
But the reality is the market is already adapting. What we are finding is that the fossil fuel in, um, industry is slowly collapsing. That coal, uh, there's a bit of life left in gas, um, but coal is, is on the way out and oil is significantly plateauing as well. So I do believe we can have some hope that this uh, sixth myth is wrong. Um, in reality, what we're living through is a time of change that's quite dramatic, introducing a different kind of economy, a green economy, one where we do get wealthier, but we get wealthier without the fossil fuels. So we decouple growth from fossil fuel consumption. And in this area, we need a lot of technology, we need not a lot of policy change, we need a lot of lifestyle and behaviour change. Uh, everything needs to change. Um, but to believe that it's not possible to change is to, to actually say that in any one of these waves we've been through, that it was too hard and that we're just going to go down here and keep going down. Well, we're not. We come out of it and the potential to create a whole new economy is there.